I worship you, Jesus. I praise you, Jesus. There are angels of the Lord in this house. Amen. I'm not going to preach a sermon. We're going to give instruction for a mass outpouring of healing in this place tonight. The Lord dealt with me a minute ago, said, you don't need to pray for my mantles to fall. The mantles of fivefold ministry, he said they already have it. He said, pray that instead of my mantles falling, that the scales would fall from their eyes so that they could see what I have already given them. He spoke, he, I leaned over to Brother Robinette and said, well, he's preaching my sermon, which is really my sermon. It's God's sermon. And I, I knew all day long, I thought, I'm not preaching today. I just had that feeling in my spirit. I'm not going to have to preach this. But I will just recognize something, that the spirit of fear has caused us to become blind to what God has given to us through the power of the Holy Ghost. Spirit of fear. The spirit of fear, I've become very acquainted with the spirit of fear. In fact, I was here at this church in January, February, and March of 2021. Brother Myers opened this house, this church is a place of refuge for my family and I after we buried our daughter in November of 2020. And I was in the evangelist quarters when that spirit of fear walked into my room and I could feel him as if it was a tangible presence that walked into my room. And I, I, I turned the light on and I didn't see anything and I prayed, I rebuked it. I said, Jesus, I spoke in tongues and he just stood right there. And for seven days, he stood with me, and I could go on and on and on for hours of details of things that occurred. And <clears throat> but I was confused because I prayed, and I wasn't living in sin. I mean, I was preaching. We were in revival, and I was praying, and I was fasting. In fact, I'd been on a two-week fast, and I was praying, and he was still there. That spirit of fear was with me. And, and after a while, I prayed, and I said, God, why? When the Bible says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you, why is this thing not leaving me? And the Lord said, he's not leaving you because I sent him to you. He said, I sent this spirit to you so that you could know him and become a companion to him so that wherever you go, when he's there, you'll know it instantly. That spirit of fear lived with me periodically for the next 365 days. He would walk into my bedroom uh, in, in Austin at our home, and he would walk into our bedroom when I was trying to sleep. And throughout that year, I slept very little because that spirit of fear would walk and stand by my bedside. And I, could, I became so intimate with that spirit of fear that I could hear the voice of that spirit speaking to me. That spirit told me things that Brother Caleb Herring preached tonight. That spirit came to me and said things like, you don't really have to speak in tongues. See, I, I wasn't raised in this, and most of you may have heard my testimony, and I'm not going to go into it other than to say I wasn't raised in this. I was raised in a church that used to be Pentecostal, a church that left the United Pentecostal Church and compromised everything and so when that spirit of fear began to speak to me, it was very relevant. It resonated in my mind because I was raised on the other side of the fence. And when he began to say things like, you don't have to speak in tongues to be saved. I could hear it. I remember I was in the youth chapel across this street here in the Life Center. And that spirit came to me and said, you don't have to say in the name of Jesus when you're baptized to be saved. I could hear him say that to me. That spirit of fear then came to me and said, tell your wife she doesn't have to let her hair grow long in order to cover the glory of God. That spirit spoke those exact words to me. That spirit of fear then told me to reach out to pastors that used to be Pentecostal. He spoke the names of backslidden preachers and pastors and said, call them. They'll understand what you're going through. They'll help you. And I, was, I had been praying and fasting for several weeks. And, and at that moment, I saw a crossroads 
in my spirit and I said, I can either go this way or I can go this way. I, I can go, I can go to those that have backslidden and those that have compromised, or I can go to those that have given everything they've got to buy in and to sell out with everything that they have for this truth and for this doctrine. And I remember saying, God, I want to connect to men of God. I want to connect to apostolic men of God who aren't laying aside uh, truth and doctrine, but God, they're going all out uh, for this truth, for your word that you have given us. I want to be connected to men of God uh, that preach this truth, that believe this truth. God did a miracle that I won't, I don't, I don't, don't need to go into right now, but God did a miracle. In fact, I spoke a name of a preacher at 3 a.m. right here in the Life Center. At 3 a.m., I spoke the name of a man of God in the United Pentecostal Church that I consider a hero of ours and I had never met. And that was at 3 a.m. on Thursday morning. And by 7 o'clock that night, I was standing in his pulpit preaching at his church. That spirit of fear would come and go. And as I said earlier, he would come into my bedroom at our home and he would stand next to me and he would say these words. He would say, as soon as you close your eyes, I'm going to kill your son. Spirit of fear tries to inflict confusion. That's why, that's why this whole thing about gender confusion is a spiritual attack. Did you know that people that deal with what they call gender confusion are 300% more likely to commit suicide? So the devil said, oh, I don't have to kill them. I just have to confuse them and they'll kill themselves. You see, the spirit of fear does not care what you're afraid of as long as you're afraid of something. Satan says, oh, you're not afraid of me anymore, apostolic people, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You're not afraid of me anymore? Okay, I'll make you afraid of each other. Through so-called racism and, 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 and so-called COVID-19 and so-called sicknesses and things that I'll make you afraid of each other. That spirit of fear would tell me, I'm going to take your son. I'm going to give sickness to your wife. I'm going to kill your family. I'll never forget when my three-year-old son walked in in the middle of the night. He, he never comes to my side of the bed in the middle of the night because I just say, oh, you know, dry it up and go back to bed, you know. He normally goes to mama's side of the bed because, you know, she'll rock him back to sleep. He comes to my side of the bed and he wakes me up and he's crying. He's at the time three years old and he says, daddy, daddy, wake up, wake up. He said, I just had a nightmare. I said, what was it? He said, in my dream, mommy was dead. I said, really, what happened? He said, I killed her, a three-year-old. He don't watch movies. He don't do nothing, none of that stuff. That same spirit of fear was now speaking to my three-year-old son. This recent summer at youth camps that I got to go to and other meetings this summer, I heard from young people who were dealing with things that I've personally never heard them dealing with. I, I have a list in my Bible that's over there, a, a long list of youth camp after youth camp that I, I would write down young men and young women who would, young men and young women who would come to me and say, Brother Green, I've got to tell you, I'm dealing with this and I'm dealing with this and I'm fighting this and I'm struggling with this. These were things that I've never heard young people confess in an apostolic church saying they were dealing with certain things. One of the most prevalent things that I wrote on that list, suicide, 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 suicide. In one youth camp that I was at this summer in America, in a United Pentecostal Church youth camp, we had two young people try to commit suicide at the youth camp. One of them was found hanging outside in the middle of the night. They were able to resuscitate him just in time. So when the man of God says, I'm going to deal with that spirit. He was right in the Holy Ghost because we're dealing with this. And it's interesting to me that just before the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, the disciples dealt with this. They were 12 disciples. They were 12 disciples. Until one of them betrayed Jesus. 
They were sitting in the same room together called the upper room. The last supper was in a room called the upper room. In fact, if you study, it's the same upper room that they were in on the day of Pentecost. <laughs> you didn't know that. That's why you just went quiet right there. They were in an upper room having the last supper, sharing the last supper with Jesus. And Jesus stops and says, one of you who's eating with me is going to betray me. And instead of reaching out to the one who was going to betray him, they got selfish and said, is it me, Lord? Is it me, Lord? I, I hope it's not me, Lord. Is it me, Lord? They knew who it was. He already had the traits of betrayal written all over him. And when Jesus revealed who it was, the Bible says that they were relieved, if you read between the lines, because they left the upper room. Judas leaves, and they start singing a hymnal, singing a praise song. How could you sing a praise song when Jesus had just said, one of you in this room is going to betray me? What they should have done is gone up to Judas and said, hey, I know I know you've got greed in your heart and I know you've got insecurity and I know there's fear and I, I know there's a misunderstanding and I know there's darkness, but we're going to do this together. They should have handcuffed themselves to Judas and said, you're not leaving my sight. We're going to get through this together. But he slipped through their fingers into a lake of fire. And do you know what the first sermon that Peter preached in the upper room was? It was not repentance and baptism in Jesus' name and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. It was not the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it was not this is that spoken by Joel. His first sermon that he preached in the upper room, the Bible says he stood up and said, Judas is dead. They had dealt with the suicide in their team, in their family. They had dealt with suicide. The Bible tells us that they were in the upper room. Have you ever wondered how 120 people showed up? The Bible tells us in Acts 1, it says that they continued daily. Here it is, in unity and in prayer. Brothers, they're dealing with the suicide. Can you imagine can you imagine one of your peers that you've lived with the last few years, you've done miracles with, you've heard the voice of God, and now he just committed suicide. And watch this. He committed suicide for the guilt of the same sin that you committed because they all betrayed Jesus. And not only that, you were right there. You could have encouraged him, prayed for him, loved him, but he's gone. In a lake of fire. And so they go back to the upper room. The Bible says they were in the upper room where they had been staying. That's how we know it was the same upper room from the Last Supper now to the day of Pentecost. Stay with me. I'm almost done. They're in the upper room. And the Bible says they continued in unity. Everybody say unity. They continued daily in unity and in prayer. They said we might have just faced a tragedy of suicide. The most tragic of circumstances. The most tragic form of division we could suffer is suicide. And they said, but we can't stop praying. We can't become divided now. We've got to stay unified. And the Bible says as a result of their continual unity in prayer, people started marching up the stairs. There's something going on out there. There's a prayer meeting going on up there. Who is it? The Bible says Mary came in. The brothers of Jesus came in. And before you know it, there was 120 people in the upper room. They hadn't passed out a card, a flyer, knocked a door, done any outreach program. They just said, we got to keep praying. we got to stay together. we got to be unified. We've suffered a loss of, of suicide and tragic devastation in our church. But we've got to stay unified. We've got to keep praying. Now, here's where we got to get to, and the Lord is going to pour out his spirit. The scales are going to come off our eyes because Jesus shows up, and the Bible says that he appeared to the 11, not the 12, the 11. 
He appeared to the 11. They should have been 12 disciples, but they let one slip through their fingers. So he appears to the 11. 11 is a number of destruction and chaos and devastation. It's a number of confusion, and now they're just 11 disciples. And he preached that we are the 11th hour apostolic people. We are in an hour of chaos and confusion. We are in an hour of darkness, and now they're just 11. And Jesus appears to the 11, and watch this. The Bible says in Mark 16, 14, he appeared unto the 11 as they sat at meat and he upbraided them. That means he rebuked them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Now here's where the scales fall off. Matthew records it, that when Jesus appeared to the 11, they ran and worshiped Jesus, but some doubted. How could you doubt after you've lived with the man Jesus Christ and all that you've seen, all that you've heard, all that you've witnessed, now he's died and then raised himself from the grave and shown himself to you and let you put your hand in his side and you've seen his nail-scarred hands. At that point, is there anybody in the room that's with me that says, I'll never doubt again? But they're still doubting. Could you doubt after all that you've witnessed? So now put yourself in the shoes of Jesus. You say, oh, you're not 12 anymore. You're just 11. 11 is incomplete. I need 12 for the foundations of heaven. I need 12 for the gates of heaven. And now you're just 11? I guess I'll go find somebody else. Oh, you're doubting after all I did for you? You're insecure. You're afraid after all I've done for you. If I were Jesus, I would have said, go home. I'll find someone else. Anybody else would have done that? I want to find somebody like a brother Robinette that's never tasted the word doubt in his mouth. Probably can't spell doubt. He would spell it D-O-W-T. Because he don't know what doubt is. I'll go find a Lee Stone King that doesn't know what insecurity is. After all I've done for you, you're still doubting me. I died. I raised myself from the grave and you're still doubting me. But what did Jesus say to them? Go to the next verse. And he said unto them, go ye. I don't know about you, but I don't say that anymore. Go ye. That's King James. The way I say it is, you go. Turn to your neighbor and say, you go. He's looking at the 11, incomplete, insecure, afraid, full of doubt and hardness in their heart. And he says, you still got what it takes. You go. Where? Into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Here it is. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Here's your sermon, Brother Herring, uh, and they're going to change the atmosphere. Uh, they're going to cast out devils. Uh, they're going to speak in new tongues. Uh, they're going to take up serpents. Uh, they shall lay hands uh, on the sick, uh, and they shall recover. I really feel God's given me a word. And God said, you cannot experience the power of my name until you trust the purpose of my name. You are not perfect. You are not great. You are not worthy. You are not the most high and the most anointed. You have no power to heal anybody. You can't save anybody. You can't deliver anybody. All you can do is be there and be a vessel of the Holy Ghost and fire.
scales will come off our eyes tonight uh, when we realize uh, that they doubted, uh, they were hard in their hearts, uh, they didn't believe, and yet they walked with him. How much more does God want to use us uh, when we're over 2,000 years removed from God walking in the flesh? Just for a moment, lift up your hands and let scales fall off your eyes. The 11th hour. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to put your hands down. And if everybody can stand together, if you're from the ages of 12 to 30 years old, I want you to raise a hand and keep it up. Keep up your hand. If you don't mind, keep your hand up. If it gets tired, switch hands. The Lord burdened me this week for our teenagers and our 20-something-year-olds. We're sitting with Brother Bounds yesterday, and he said, man, I'm so burdened for our young people, the teenagers and the 20-something-year-olds. He talked about a conference he was at two weeks ago when there was 20-something-year-old young people who got out of the aisle over in Modesto, California. He said it was a good service until those 20-something-year-olds got out and started rolling on the floor and dancing and shouting and worshiping. He said the service was over. Everybody got involved. Everybody jumped in. I'm telling you the Lord is going to do something tonight for this generation right here uh, for those of you uh, between the ages of 12 and 30 uh, the Lord is about to do a divine shift uh, there's a divine intervention uh, of a release uh, in your spirit tonight uh, I wish there was a witness uh, that would stop standing there with your mouth closed uh, and would lift up your voice and say yes I want our elders to come back. I want our leaders to come back. If you're, listen, if you're a pastor, if you're a pastor's wife, and you're over this age of 30, I want to ask you to come stand on the platform, push these young people over. They'll get back up. They're resilient. But I want everybody over the age of 30 that is a minister or a spouse of a minister, I want you to hurry, get to this platform. I know you're old, but get to the platform as fast as you can. Did you know? Everybody say, did you know? Did you know, did you know that according to Jewish historical tradition that the disciples, we don't have exact evidence of the exact age that they were, but according to Jewish tradition, they were from the age of 13 to 30. See, when people didn't know that, you just get a mmm. From the ages of 13 to 30. Now, I'm only 34, but I'm an elder to you. And I believe in our elders. I believe, man, I feel a prophetic anointing. I feel that there is a unity from the elder generation to the younger generation like we've never seen before. I believe that exponential growth, which is what will lead us to billions of souls receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, it will only happen 
when the elder and the younger are united. David killed Goliath. That's when Saul's heart began to change for David. I felt this while Brother Caleb was preaching in the first half of his sermon. I felt it and then it broke. There was, there was a spirit in the room while Brother Herring, Caleb Herring was preaching. There was a spirit in the room that was saying, I hope he does good, just not too good. I could feel it. The reason why I know that spirit, because I used to be possessed by that spirit. I was possessed by that spirit of Satan. The spirit of comparison and competition. You know what comparison breeds? It breeds compromise. Unless you compare yourself to the cross. That's the only thing you're supposed to compare yourself to. Can I speak to this generation for just a second? Let's speak to this generation for just a moment. Uh, the only thing we're in competition against, it's not one another. It's not the Trinitarians. It's not Satan. The only thing we're in competition against is time. We are racing the rapture to win every soul that we can win. And I, I did a little sneaker preach here, okay? I, I, I feel you, but I didn't get to preach all my notes. And they were really good. And I'm okay with that as long as God shows up. I didn't used to believe that. I used to, I used to preach before some of these heroes, and I thought, I'm going to preach so good that they're not going to get to preach. That's what I used to think. And God had to humble me. I remember you talked about a season of consecration. I remember the only 40-day fast I ever went on, and you think I'm bragging, wait till I tell you this. I did a 40-day fast thinking I'm going to see angels and demons and the heavens are going to open up. I only got one word that entire 40-day fast, and it wasn't even for me. I was at Because of the Times on this 40-day fast, and I'm standing there next to Landon Gore, one of my best buddies, and... You know, when you're standing in the crowd at a conference like this, you're hoping one of these heroes will come lay hands on you. And there's nothing wrong with that, wanting them to lay hands on you. But when that is your only pursuit, as it was mine, and God's trying to do his own thing with you, you miss it. And I'm standing there next to Brother Gore, and I thought, man, if one of those guys up there on the platform could just come and find me on the back row and lay hands on me, phew, and then there was like an outbreak of the Holy Ghost, and I saw Brother Stan Gleason start coming off the platform, and I thought, man, that'd be cool if he was getting off the platform to come pray with me. But, that, you know, that's a long shot. And then I'm watching him, you know, and he's getting closer and closer. He's weaving his way, and I'm thinking, oh, my Lord, this might really happen. Going down this aisle, going down this aisle, he's getting closer, getting closer, getting closer, and he gets to my aisle, and I, I do this. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Act like I was praying. Ha, da, 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 da. <laughs> Maybe he'll see my desperation and come and pray for me. And then he taps me on the shoulder. And I said, my time has come. <laughs> and he says, hey, Chris. Yes, Bishop. Can you get Landon for me? <laughs> sure, but did you have a word for me first? No, get Landon for me. Fetch. Uh, hey, hey, Landon, this old guy wants you. <laughs> Landon goes over there. I'm thinking, I'm the one fasting. <laughs> I'm the one not eating here. I'm on the week three of no food, no Chick-fil-A, Brother Landon. If you know him, you know him. I'm not eating Where's my blessing? The Lord speaks to me and says, do not confuse man's opportunities with the will of God. If you confuse man's opportunities with my will, then you will seek to impress man instead of please God. And God said, when you seek to impress man, you will walk through doors that man opens. And you will walk into rooms that I do not protect. I 
I said, God, I'm sorry. How do I break this spirit of pride? He said, lay your hands on your brother and pray that I will bless him more than I'll bless you. In fact, we were talking about this yesterday a little bit. In fact, he went and preached every event and every revival for Brother Gleason. And, you know, I'm texting him and trying to root him on. You know, I'm trying to break the spirit in me. I'm trying to break that spirit of comparison and competition in me. And then he gets asked to preach the Passing the Mantle Conference at Brother Gleason's church. And so I booked a ticket. I got a rental car. I got a hotel room. I wasn't asked to preach. I wasn't invited there. I flew there, got on the front row to root him on to break that spirit in me and let Satan know you're not going to divide us. No, 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 no. You're not going to divide us. We are one. We're on the same team. Hey, if I strike out three times, but you hit the game-winning home run, newsflash, we all win. We all win. I said we all We all win. I don't care who speaks the word of faith in Brazil when 30,000 people receive the Holy Ghost. As long as I see them in heaven walking down streets of gold, that's all I care about. We gotta, we gotta cut the head off of the spirit of competition tonight. Let me tell you what happened. David killed Goliath and Saul loved David while he was holding a harp. While he was playing a harp, he did good. But then when he did too good, Saul said, I hate him. He picked up a spear to kill him. And he heard the song, the praise team got up and sang. And they sang a song that went like this. Saul has killed his thousands and David his see Saul's spirit heard the song wrong he thought it was a song of competition it wasn't it was a song of exponential growth through unity watch what did God say God's word said where one can put a thousand to flight where one can put a thousand to flight Two can put 10,000 to flight. The praise team was singing, saying, we're finally one. We've got both generations. We've got the elder and the younger. We're going from thousands to billions. Somebody shout it. We are one. We are one. We are one. We are one. And we shall see billions. I wish we could take 30 seconds and you'd grab the hand and dance in the Holy Ghost. Grab somebody's hand and dance in the Holy Ghost. We are one. We are one. We are one. We are one. Shataya yataya rebasa. Hashando rabaha. Sende ya la bokondo rebaha. Shataya taya rebasa taya rabaha. His head's coming off. His head's coming off. We are one in the Holy Ghost. We are one.
Hatari Arabaha. Hayarabaha Sata. You don't need a mantle to fall on you tonight. You've already got it in your spirit. Paul said, stir up the gift that's already in you. There are mantles of apostles, of prophets, evangelists, of pastors, and teachers. I wish somebody would say amen. The gift of faith. Somebody say amen. The gifts of healing. The working of miracles. The word of knowledge. The word of wisdom. It's in this place. The discerning of spirits and the gifts of healing. This is what we're going to do. I felt the Holy Ghost tell me to let Brother Robinette release the word of faith. He doesn't want to do it because he's so humble in the Holy Ghost. Uh, he wants to give somebody else a chance, but God has chosen him tonight. Uh, and so what we're going to do right now, nobody's going to receive anything. Uh, nobody's going to activate anything in your spirit uh, if you're standing alone by yourself. I want everybody, man to man, woman to woman, or spouse with their spouse, to be linked up arm in arm, just like this. Everybody link up in the Holy Ghost. The gifts of the Spirit are about to be activated in you. The fivefold ministry, the fivefold ministry is about to be loosed inside of you. Get ready. Get ready as Brother Robinette prays the word of faith. Everybody just listen. Everybody listen and look right here. Everybody listen and look right here. Everybody listen, nobody praying. There's a lot of emotion, there's a lot of inspiration here, but we're gonna give instruction because the Bible says where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Amen? I don't want you to disconnect through this prayer. Nobody's gonna raise your hands, okay? Yeah, come on. Nobody's gonna disconnect. We are united as one. You know what is interesting to me is when Jesus said, Brother Robinette preached it today, all hell is going to break loose. In Luke 21, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, pestilence and all this stuff. He said, this is what I want you to do. It's really profound. I want you to lift up your head and look up. For your redemption. Everybody say Redemption. Your redemption draweth nigh. The word redemption literally translates to a divine release that has been initiated by a payment of ransom. You don't owe God anything. You don't owe the devil anything. There's about to be a divine release that's already been paid for by his blood. But before we get to the release... We need to stop and pray a prayer of repentance. I want every eye closed. This is the only time you're allowed to bow your head if you feel to do so. But the Bible says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So I want you to take just a moment and I want you to lift up your voice as you are united with your brother and sister. And I want you to pray a prayer of divine cleansing, of divine repentance. I turn my life back to you. God, forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean of division wash me clean of my pride wash me clean God of insecurity of iniquity of transgression wash me create in me a clean heart renew right spirit
That's it. Uh, come on. Let rivers of living water begin to spring forth. Uh, clean water, uh, pure water. Uh, blessed are they uh, of a pure heart, uh, for they shall see God. God, forgive me. God, forgive me, God, of my pride, of my fear. Forgive me, God, of speaking words that are impure, Lord. Forgive me, God, of killing in the spirit, Lord. Forgive me, Lord, for division. Forgive me, Lord. Wash my spirit tonight with your love and mercy and grace. Let me be one as you are one. Let me be one as you are one. I haven't told him. What do you want to do? No, nope, go ahead. I was going to walk him through the four, other, four other steps. Don't let them do anything until I do. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. I think we need about 30 seconds of a hallelujah praise. Come on, somebody love them. Somebody love them. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I don't deserve your mercy, but you gave it anyways. I love you, Jesus. Now, everybody listen. Do not disconnect. Nobody's standing alone. Amen. In the next few seconds, don't do it until we release the word of faith. There is a spiritual synergy that I just spoke of. One in a thousand, two in ten thousand. God only knows the apostolic atmosphere we're about, about to walk into in the next little while when we do this together. We do this overseas and we've begun doing this in North America at Holy Ghost Crusades. But in just a moment, when Brother Robinette comes and releases the prayer of faith, he's going to end his prayer by shouting, Hallelujah. Everybody say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you say it again with boldness? Hallelujah. Do you hear the difference? The first one was good, but the second one was authority. Don't do it like you did it the first time. Do it like you did it the second time and even then some. When he prays the prayer of faith and shouts hallelujah with everything, lose your voice, preachers. I don't care where you're preaching Sunday. Lose your voice when you shout hallelujah. And I prophesy in this place a rushing, mighty wind of the Holy Ghost that is going to fill this room from center to circumference. And it's going to overflow. And it's going to get in your car with you and on the plane with you and your church. It's going to see revival because of what's about to happen in this place. Somebody say amen. amen. Would you say, I believe it? I believe it. Say, I want, I want it. Say, I receive it. I receive it. Hallelujah, Lord. But this is what else we're going to do. We're not going to lift up our hands tonight because we've already received. We've already surrendered. We don't need to receive anything. We've got to activate what's already in here. He can do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. He's waiting on in us. That's what he's waiting on. So in a moment when Brother Robinette takes a microphone, what we're going to do is we're going to close our eyes so that we're not distracted or intimidated by anything going on around us so that we are focused on what God's about to do. And in a moment... When Brother Robinette takes the microphone, don't do it just yet, but you're going to lift up your head. Just look at me. I know this is juvenile, but just look, look at me. See, when I'm like this, you immediately you see doubt, self-doubt, insecurity. But when I just go like this, 
There's an atmosphere change. Apostolic atmosphere changes when we point our focus upward. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to have our eyes closed. <laughs> We're going to lift up our head. And when he releases the word of faith as loud as you can until you're speaking in tongues, you're going to begin to shout, Hallelujah. Brother Robinette, will you come? Lift up your voices right now and begin to praise the Lord. All of you ministers, step forward. Step forward with us. Step forward with us. Come, come. Here it comes. By the authority of the Word of God. By the power of the name Jesus. By the power of the Holy Ghost. Receive it right now. Hallelujah. Receive it. Receive it, receive it, receive it. Jesus, you have victory in the name of Jesus. You have it now. Yatalabosha, Yandalamashata. Oh, 
Shata, Ikayana Lamasi, Yana Lamasha. are healed your spirits healed your mind is healed your body's healed victory victory italaba shata ianda la moshata laba ikayona la mosha atala moshata itayana la basi ikayana la mosh Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yirana ba shirimi yarabatia. Yirana ba talaba yarabasharana. Yirana ba yarabatini yarabashi. Yirana ba yarabatalaba yarab. 
Clap your hands to the Lord. Lift up your voice one more time. Lift up your voice one more time. Let victory fill the atmosphere. When we were in the nation of Brazil about two months ago, on the opening night of the crusade, something unprecedented happened. When we began to pray for miracles, Brother Hearing, all of a sudden, it wasn't physical, but it was emotional, it was mental, it was spiritual, it was God realigning, taking that spirit of confusion out of his people and giving them a sound mind and a sound heart and a sound spirit so they could do a sound kingdom work in these last days. Multitudes. I'm talking thousands upon thousands of people began to testify of God healing their minds, their hearts, the spirit of suicide being taken from them and confusion coming out of them. So if tonight you felt deliverance come in this room, 
and you felt healing in your mind, in your heart, in your emotions. I want you to lift up both of your hands right now. Lift up both of your hands. And I want you to begin to thank the Lord. Wave your hands as a wave offering. Look at that. Look at what God has done. Look at what God has done. come over you. The Lord hath not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and the sound mind. That enemy that has been attacking your mind, your spirit, and your heart has now become irrelevant. Did you hear what I said? That enemy is now irrelevant. The greatness and the glory of the Lord has come upon you and you are free. That's what the Lord told me was going to happen in this hour. Not that there would not be any enemies, but that every one of them would be irrelevant. That the greatness of the glory of the Lord in this hour and the power of the church of the living God in this hour would be so brilliant and so bright and so powerful that when the enemy shows up, we just... I don't have time for you. You're irrelevant. I don't even know how many hundreds were delivered emotionally, mentally, spiritually. Maybe you came in this altar physically needing a touch from the Lord tonight. There's no doubt in my mind that God has healed you. I have absolute confidence that God has healed every person in this room. The cancer is gone. The tumors are gone. The diabetes is gone. The livers are healed. The kidneys are healed. The back pain's gone. The Come on and shout like you believe it. It's irrelevant. Listen, if you came in this place needing a physical touch from the Lord, we're going to do exactly what we do on crusades. I want you to begin to move around and see if that pain's gone. See if that situation has changed. And if you can tell that the Lord has healed your body, I want you to lift up both of your hands right now as high as you can. Lift them up as high as you can. And I want you to make those a wave offering unto the Lord. Let it be a wave. Now one more time, everybody in this room, lift up both of your hands and let out a shout. Let out a shout. Yeah. 